Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started with the webinar today. I appreciate all of you taking the time out of your day to join us. Uh, I'm going to quickly run through uh, the agenda of the webinar, and, um, and then I'll be handing over to the star of the show. So uh, just very quickly, a quick introduction. Um, so my name is Josh Van Tonder. I'm uh, the Director of Product Marketing here at, uh, at Criticism. And um, looks like our present, presenting machine just had a little hiccup there. So uh, anyway, so I, I, I'm at Criticism, and I'm, I'm pleased to be joined with uh, Dr. Einar Bolsat, who will be our uh, star of the show today. So what I'm going to quickly do is walk you through uh, just a quick agenda, do some intros, and then, then we're going to kick this off. So uh, just to give you a sense of where we're going to go for the, the rest of the time, um, INR has prepared, you know, plus or minus 30 minutes worth of content, but I, I think, you know, maybe with some questions, um, you know, we'll probably go 40 minutes or so. And uh, in terms of just housekeeping things, there's a chat pod, and we certainly would welcome your questions as we're going through this. Uh, we'll tackle those if it makes sense during the web and right, you know, right as they come up, or, uh, you know, if, if necessary, queue them up at the end, and INR will, will tackle them at the end. <laughs> So we'll walk through sort of five segments. Um, Einar's going to talk a bit about strategy and how to how to maintain the the, uh, the app as it's it's out in the wild. Measurements and how do you optimize and uh, re-engage with your audience? So Einar, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're pleased to have you here. And uh, you know we we worked with Einar for quite some time. He's a, really a rock star, which is why we <laughs> brought him here to help share some best practices. So Einar, um, you've, you've, you've been a professor. Yes. Uh, you've, uh, you've built companies. I have. And uh, your current company is, is App Aftercare. Yep. So just give us the, um, the thumbnail sketch on, on App Aftercare, because I think it really tees up you know, what we're going to talk about. In a sure. So App Aftercare basically grew out of some of the consulting work I was doing. And what it boils down to is, I was seeing a lot of the time big agencies, freelancers, developers, who develop like a majority of the apps are in the App Store. Okay. So in some estimates, about 70% of the apps that are in the App Store are built by agencies and, and developers. And then companies are basically left uh, by themselves once the app is in the App Store. So um, mostly focused on iOS. But, so what I do is basically um, take care of, maintain, and optimize existing apps. So that means, you know, I have an interview, an overview of most of the best technologies to use, um, the tips and tricks and best practices, and just apply them to my client's app so that they get the return on investment that they, you know, the full return on investment that they can expect from actually, you know, investing in their app in the first place. Well, welcome. It's, I think, you know, there's a wealth of information that I think we're going to share with, with the audience today. So before we dive into that, just wanted to give you one quick overview of, of criticism, and then uh, let's get to the meat of this all right, it worked. It worked. <laughs> um, so Criticism is um, the leading mobile app performance management company. And um, what we do is we work with companies to provide diagnostic, real-time diagnostic information about the performance of their, their applications. And we monitor over 20,000 apps and, and uh, have a very large footprint, about a billion users in 120 countries. And what we do is, is help companies understand how well their mobile apps are working in the hands of their users, whether those are consumers or, or employees. And uh, we do that by providing diagnostics about crashes and the responsiveness of the services you connect to, as well as business critical transactions. So we're, we're used by companies like PayPal, and Urban Outfitters, um, LinkedIn, Netflix, and a, a number of you know really great companies have put their trust in us. So uh, that's that's all I'm going to say about us for for now. We're going to switch gears into Einar's presentation and uh, get rolling here. So um, Einar, please thank you. Take it away. Thank you, Josh. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> I'm just going to be talking basically about the best practices and some of the tips and tricks that I'm seeing that, that really that really work and, and really what I'm trying to uh, highlight is sort of what sort of thing you should be doing once your app is in the App Store and, and what you can do to really optimize that part of it. Um, 
why do I um, like why do I why should I even be talking about that kind of thing? Like what Josh was saying, um, a former CS prof at Cornell, I've been building iOS apps since before there was a an actual SDK, and I have um, you know participated in hundreds and hundreds of apps, uh, both mostly iOS but some Android too, um, and I've done you know strategy um, development optimization stuff for companies from you know Dell, Motorola, GM, Smithsonian, through to you know uh, tons of um, Silicon Valley startups. Um, some of which you heard of, some of which I'm sure the founders hope they soon you will have heard of. <laughs> um, so the outline of the talk basically is, <clears throat> first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about having clear in your mind, like what is it, why do you have an app in the first place? Um, it used to be a couple of years ago that, you know, as long as you, had, you just had to have an app and it was a checklist and, and that was it, we have an app, so, so you know, we're all good and ready to go. Um, that's that's no longer good enough, I don't think. And it, it really the decision that you're the sort of clear thesis that you're putting you're, you're putting in front of your mind right then that sort of informs the rest of the choices you should be making um, in terms of you know how to optimize and, and how to really be think strategically about your app. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about maintenance. You know, the key thing is, you know, you got to squash crashes, you got to fix servers. Why is that important? How do we do that? You know, clearly I'm going to mention criticism because, you know, here we are. Um, but also talk about some other tools and some of the things, you know, like how to, how to think about this and, um, you know, best practices that I see there. Um, second, the third part will be about, you know, once you have the app under control, once you have, you know, crashes taken care of, like, what do you do then? Like, how do you, and this boils down to measuring. You've got to understand what I call, you know, what are your buy metrics in your app? That is, you know, what is the payoff event that you're hoping um, that people will take? Um, through to, like, looking at things like engagement and churn metrics. And I'll, I'll be a little bit more um, specific about that once we get to that. Um, the second part, the fourth part is like, okay, you measured all these things. You measured, you know, what 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 uh, drives engagement, what what um, increases retention. How do you optimize that? What kind of tools are out there, um, just off the shelf, that you could add in that would add a, a real have a real market improvement in those metrics for you? And then finally, I'll talk about things like um, a couple of more advanced things that are, you know, things that I call active reengagement campaigns, um, and then how to do things like custom onboarding, which is now. Uh, possible and, and some of the more uh, forward-thinking apps are trying to do that, and you should think about doing that for your own app. It's just you know just to be clear, I mean this isn't academic. I mean you you do this, you're in the trenches with all yeah, the oh yeah, 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 stuff. yeah. So yeah, this yeah. is you know these are best practices. Um, these are these are things that I actually add. Like when people come in the door and they pay me money to do this, this is what I add in because I know that once I add this, they'll see real value, and that's why they keep paying me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is yeah, this is not me uh, from up on high. Um, so the first thing we got to think about is like why why do you have this app in the first place? Now I've put up some some examples here, but I, I think it's important before you start thinking about how to optimize your app, how to maintain it, how to do things like this. What what is it that you're wanting the the app to do for you or your business? Is it you know things like increasing customer engagement? Are you, are you looking to expand an existing service? I mean this is a very common use case among my clients at least. Is they have a SaaS service delivered over the web, and they want to basically be able to extend that onto, you know, iPhones, Androids, iPads, whatever. Um, you know, but it could be a number of other things too, including, you know, make a bazillion dollars, but it's important to have that in mind going forward because it informs what kind of things you should be doing and how you should be approaching them. Um, so, you know, normally if this was an open classroom, I'd be asking, like, what are you going to use for your app, but I'm going to skip that for now. <laughs> so, First of all, um, sort of the baseline on which you got to build things is you got to take care of crashes. It's um, one of the number one reasons why you get a one-star review is because the, your app is crashing. And it's sort of this vicious cycle in the sense that um, if you're, you're on a certain ranking, you're getting bad reviews because of, of crashes, which leads to less downloads, which leads to less lower rankings, which in lower rankings, that means less downloads. And it's sort of this downward spiral of doom. Once you start getting a significant amount of, of crashes, you're in a bad place. And it doesn't really matter. Like, if, you, if your app, if you're seeing in your reviews on the App Store or on a Google Play that says, okay, the app is crashing for me, I can't see it, then, then you're already in trouble. Like, there's no point at that point to start 
uh, doing things like optimizing the onboarding funnel or, you know, uh, doing some of the more advanced stuff we'll talk about. Um, the problem with this is that really the provided tools, and, and this is particularly true on the iOS side, but also really on, on, on Google, uh, Google Play, is that the provided tools are really bad. Like, I have never, I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for a very long time, and I, I've, you know, I've been through um, situations where there's been a lot of crashes, but I've never ever had Apple report accurately a crash to me. Like, if I just looked at Apple, I've never had an app crash, which, trust me, is not true. We would wish, no. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, <laughs> that'd be really nice. But, but the reality is, like, if you have any, reasonably sized app, you're going to have crashes, like, it, because it's almost impossible to cover every single possible combination of, you know, network condition or, you know, device or form factor or use case or whatever. So you're going to have it. So you're much better off taking the preactive set to be like, okay, we're going to have it. How do we do with it? How to prioritize it? You know, how do we do this? Um, how do we triage this as quickly as possible? Now, um, the flip side of the fact that there's so, that your, you know, crashes are so bad, um, in some cases, having some crashes, which you kind of know is inevitable, and then quickly fixing them can end up being better for you than not having ones in the first place. Now, a couple of reasons for that is that people are already downloading your app and they, they want you to succeed, succeed. I mean, um, this is sort of confirmation bias to play in the sense that, the people who have downloaded your app, they want to know that they, they want affirmation that they made the right choice in downloading that app. So if you see some crashes and then they see that, oh, okay, they quickly fixed it, then they're like, they're rooting for you. Like, this is a good thing. They feel like you're invested in the app and they're invested in the app and everything is great. Um, furthermore, some more tactical issues on the, particularly on the iOS side, is that we see that, um, doing rapid iterations of the app, so not leaving like six months or nine months or 12 months between version updates, tends to help rankings. Um, and, and for rapid iterations, what does that mean? <coughs> once every month or two, once every couple of months. Like, but, but it wouldn't be too much to, if you're having a serious issue, to kick one out once a week. Like, if there's a lot of users having issues and you're able to fix, you know, bug Apple or to get an expedited review or in the case of Google Play, just push it out there, that wouldn't be too much. Like that would, that would be the right approach to get it up there. Um, and furthermore, like on the iOS side, the App Store actually, the, the sort of rating system rewards fixing apps in the sense that, you know, if you have an app which maybe for a while has had like two and a half stars um, and you haven't really had taken the time to fix it, but you know, kind of know you should, once you actually do that, it quickly um, starts showing the rating for only the last. Version. So if you had, you know, if the average for the last version was two and a half, if you push out a new app and that gets great ratings, um, you can quickly end up with like four and a half, five stars. Interesting. So it sort of biases the ratings towards the, towards the latest stuff. Yeah. So it's like it's, it's never too late, but you should do it quickly. So sort of my <laughs> my takeaway from that. <clears throat> um, so obviously, doing this, the right kind of tool helps. And like I said before, I've never really had any crash reports from Apple. And really, if your only approach is to look at, you know, if you're, if you're getting an issue where like your QA team is saying, oh, you know, we're having some emails about the fact that this app is crashing for a customer, cool. or we're saying, you know. Confirm sound, I think we're saying you lost it. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Hello? All right, I'm going to stop there until we confirm sound. Did someone? Uh, yep, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, sound good. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we've had some issues in the past, so just making sure we're... We also had a leaking out. roof before, so that was... Yeah, so this is not in the Bay Area. We're getting dumped on, and INR Brave is driving up for Santa Cruz in, uh, in all of this. Did you join us? That's right. Um, so, yeah, so what I was saying is basically, you know, either getting an email from your customer through your support email or um, looking at your reviews and saying, huh, there's some people uh, complaining about crashes, that's, that's too late. You know, it's, it's basically it's a trailing indicator in the sense that the damage to your rankings is already done. Um, and also, just, just because people say, oh, the app is crashing, it doesn't give you any way to how to replicate, um, how to replicate the crash. So you're, you could potentially just be you know, in the dark with the idea that, okay, we know some of the case that the, the app is crashing. And then, you know, a, a lot of the time what I see is like, you have a, you have a business that has an app and the CEO or, or somebody looks and says, you know, our app crashes, they contact the agency or the developer and, 
you know, the developer just says, I can't replicate, works fine for me. <laughs> which is which is worse than useless, like then you basically have the wrong developer. But anyway. So the thing to do is that you need some sort of a crash detection SDK shipping in your live app. Like I've seen companies do this thing, which is incredible to me, that they will install the crash detection app during QA and then take it out before they submit it to the live app. But yeah, don't do that. You want it in the live app. Um, and like I said, now I know it from our sponsor. Um, criticism basically gives you the exact lane where the crash happened in real time. And so what that gives you is sort of a, an, an immediate way to know when a specific user has a crash, where that crash was, and a lot of info on how you can fix it. And at that point, you know, the clock is ticking. Um, it, once that email comes in, and, and it usually is an email, this, this should go to your developer for a triage and prioritization immediately. It's, it's my strong recommendation that, and I've seen this in, mostly in bigger companies, they feel like they want to do every, all the bugs in one big bundle so that they don't, you know, bother the customer or something. It's better just to fix the bugs, get it out there, and done. Um, and basically prioritize based on things like, okay, how many, how many users are this affecting? Uh, you know, how serious is this for those users? Um, and so criticism does help you do that. And furthermore, and there are some others still too, which, you know, I, I'm supposedly not supposed to say. But, um, um, the, the nice thing about criticism though, is that it also gives you um, API monitoring. And this is um, important for a number of reasons. So API monitoring will do, it'll automatically look at the server endpoints that your app is talking to. And it'll say how those are performing. Are they too slow? Are they giving you 400 errors? You know, that kind of thing. And it, it doesn't also give, it, in addition to monitoring your own API endpoints, which you may have, you know, control over, hopefully, um, it also monitors third party, uh, third party endpoints. And that's important just because <clears throat> I'm sure you experience this too, right? You go to a, it's not really mobile specific, but you go to a, like a news website and you're trying to read an article and it never loads, like it takes forever to load. And if you're, if you're looking down the little browser window, it says because, oh, it, you know, it's contacting some, some ad server in Germany or something like that, and it's taking forever to do. And that, that's the kind of thing which can really affect the user experience of your users um, and you need to know about. But it's super, super hard to figure out, um, you know, from your endpoint, where maybe as a developer you're sitting there and you have, you know, a perfect internet connection and the server that you're talking to is really close. I mean, didn't Google had something just last week with this, right? Their uh, double click, I think, had issues. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is super slow. Like, like, it's like the, the user won't care that it's, you know, your ad server that's super slow. They'll just say the app doesn't work yeah. at the end of it. We, we, uh, we were actually watching the, the data on that after the fact, and it, there's a 10, 10x bump in error rates to that oh. their service during oh. the period. Oh. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's my way to do it here. And, I, and I've included a screenshot. Um, I think you know most of you guys are already criticism users in some way, but it allows you to show like you know how many users are affected. And this is actually looking at this example in more detail. It's a terrible case. It's happened seven hundred thousand times. Ouch. With half a million affected users. <laughs> um, so yeah, it gives you the idea that you can prioritize you know, when did the last happen, filter on versions, like if you've just updated a version and you have, think you've fixed these crashes, we'll filter out the old version because there's not much you can do about the fact that people haven't updated their app yet. <coughs> and you can do things like tap on the specific um, error case, drill down and look at the actual line that caused it. And from a developer's perspective, like even if, um, you know, even if it isn't your developer and you, or you're not an app app to care customers who's, who's, who's where they're looking directly at this, if you just send that line, the screenshot to a developer where you're like, please fix this for me, having this will help them a lot. And one, one quick plug, um, we have a, a new capability that lets you um, sort of model the specific business business transactions that you're trying to accomplish and attach actually a revenue or business impact to those so that when, when there's an issue, uh, you have some context around what the business impact is, or the revenue at risk. So uh, somewhat newer capability, but something that uh, a lot of customers are looking for to kind of give them a bit bit more of a 50,000 foot view of like, well, how does this performance really impact the business? That know. makes sense. It's a little bit like, you know, you, you could, not even necessarily money things, like you could, you could tie it to like, okay, who are like our important users and give those right. more higher quote money value. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
So in general, you know, like if you messed it up, most of your customers will forgive you if you fix it. Another sort of PS tool is to look at something called Aptensive. Like if you have a really bad rating and you fix it, and now you're like trying to encourage people to rate your app, look at doing um, installing Aptensive, which will do um, sort of intelligent intelligent rating prompts. And it's, it's kind of an annoying thing for some users, but it, it really is quite effective to giving you that bump. So how does that how does that work? It installs it, and then basically what it does is it. I'm sure you've seen it because it's all over now. And it's literally like okay. Once the user have done some success metrics, so they've used it three times, for example, then you say, ah, he's, then they haven't experienced a crash. Um, well, they're probably a, uh, you know, a user that's happy with the app. Let's ask him to rate. So they pop up a little rate prompt that says, would you like to rate it? How do you, how's it going so far, pretty much? Mm -hmm. And like, it's awesome. And then if they say it's awesome, then you're like, okay, well, you, it'd be really helpful if you rated it. If they say it's got issues, then instead you take them to this like form that says, I'm sorry, you're having issues. Please tell us and then we'll, we'll get back to you. Yep. Um, and it's actually just that form there is really helpful in the sense that it gives you direct feedback that isn't just like, in the old way, it's just like, oh, if they're not happy, don't even ask them, just leave them alone. Right. <laughs> you just get hammered with a crash, uh, a, a bad review. That's right. No info. That's right. Okay, so we're sort of uh, switching. Uh, this is kind of a very 10,000 foot overview, by the way, but it sort of touches what I think is the most important thing. Um, the second part is like, okay, you have the app under control. Like you have, it's, the crashes are, you know, mostly mitigated, at least the serious ones. Now what? Like this goes back to like, what is the purpose of your app in the first place? So you gotta look at how, um, you know, how are our business objectives being being met? Like depending on whatever it is that you want people to do. Um, and things like what kind of things are making people more engaged, more likely to use the app? What are making people likely to leave the app? And how do you, like, what kind of things means that people are likely to remain in the app or not come back to the app, that kind of thing. All those things you really need to start measuring if you want to do, um, if you want to start optimizing the app. <clears throat> so in terms of business metrics, this is sort of like called buy events. It really matters, like, to understand what kind of thing is it that you want your app, your users to do in your app. Is it, you know, if you're a game, it's, you know, buy a power pack for a buck ninety nine. Uh, if you're a SaaS, it can be like upgrade to the pro plan. Uh, you know, if it's more a lead gen effort, well, maybe the thing that you care about is having them contact the sales thing. If you're a hardware company, is buying a new thing, like something like that. And, and a lot of the time, <coughs> you know, like as a, as a business, you have an idea, okay, you know, five mugs got bought from our app, okay. Um, that's not usually good enough. You also have to look at sort of what the funnel and the steps are in, like, in how many people drop off from showing intent and doing whatever it was that you wanted to do, like, you know, buying a cup, through actually doing that. And so some of the things you need to look at are things like, okay, um, look at a checkout funnel. Like, if you're selling something in your app, look at from the, from the moment they hit the buy button through to the fact that they finished and have paid you the money and the thing has been shipped. How how many steps are there and how is there somewhere there, there, where there's a disproportionate amount of users to that fall off? <coughs> Similarly, this is all true for like, you know, a sign up funnel in the case where you're trying to get people to sign up for this thing or, um, you know, set up a demo if, if that's what you want your sales team to do, for example, to order something. Um, this is important. Just you, you have to know what are the payoff events, the business metrics that you care about, and, and how, like, the funnel to, to which people get to that metric, how is that performing, and where are the steps? I mean, because I've seen cases where <clears throat> people are literally falling off, and, and the conversion rate is terrible because it turned out step number two, one of the buttons wasn't wired up. You know, things like that. You just It's, it's hard to, to catch everything like that, and so having that metric measured so you can see and optimize is really important. <coughs> And then beyond that, you've got to start thinking about, okay, if you have an app where people are, you know, not just a one-off use case, uh, what are the kind of things that make people stay in the app? Like, do you know what sort of metric means, or makes a difference between a user who's engaged in your app and comes back to it, or is likely to do so in the future, versus one who doesn't? And so you want this because you can then encourage your users or new users or existing users to to take those steps to 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 get to do those things that are like more likely to make them engage so a good example is <coughs> again it's not a a mobile example but twitter found out some years back that 
any users that follow five or more people are a lot more likely to remain a user 30 days later. So they, based on that insight, they redesigned their whole sort of sign-up flow to encourage you really, really hard to, to follow at least five users. Um, the same thing is true with, um, like I'm working, one of our clients is a, is a dating app and uh, I'm working with them and, and one of the things they found, which they sort of expected too, is that a user with a profile picture, it took the time to add like their, their pretty picture up there, are much more likely to remain a user than someone who is. <clears throat> and so, your app is likely to have metrics like that, and some of the time you'll just expect, like you'll think, oh, it'll probably be this, you'll measure and you'll be right, and in some cases it won't be. So for the dating app, like we didn't realize, but it turns out that having your location showing in your profile was super important. Mm -hmm. like if, you, if you did that step and you showed your location, you were more, much more likely to remain a user. <coughs> so in this space, there are lots of tools. I mean, a lot of the time, if you're a business that already have um, some kind of um, analytics tool installed on your website. So if you have Kissmetrics, then, um, you know, maybe it's a good idea just to use Kissmetrics in your app as well and sort of extend it so that, that your BI guide and your sales team gets a full view of, of your whole business. All that being said, there are three things, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that I think are important to look at because when I talk particularly to business owners and even some developers, they aren't aware that these three tools exist and they really ha are different and high value in my view. So the first one is segment.io. And basically what these things are is um, it's sort of a one SDK to rule them all. And <clears throat> what you do is you, you add your their SDK and then you tag your events, you know, whatever events you care about. And what happens then is that you get to go to um, their website after the fact and say, you know all those events that I tagged in my app, I would like to send them to Kismetrics. Oh, and can you also, like my BI guy wants to look at them in Google Analytics. So you can do that, which is pretty cool in itself, <clears throat> but and so you can send your data to wherever it is you want to go. Um, furthermore, you can do it um, retroactively. So if you install their SDK, you start tagging events, you know, six months later, you're like, gee, it'd be really nice to have all this data inside of Kismetrics, for example, you can then say, okay, give all the existing data to Kismetrics. So they'll then backfill six months worth of data into your Kismetrics thing, even though you never thought of doing that in the first place. Um, so those are really good. And then finally, and, and, and this depends on the size team you are and whatnot, but if you have you know, BI sales type people, um, then they will love this because what they just announced is the ability to get raw access using Amazon Redshift on your data, which allows you to hook in sort of existing visualization and sales tools like Looker, like all that stuff directly into that. So they can start playing with it and start to understand more than you might do from you know, an existing SDK. Um, so those are good and certainly worth looking at if you haven't already added analytics. Um, the second one, <clears throat> which I like a lot, are um, a company called Heap. And they're different just because normally what you have to do is you have to know which event in your app you care about. So, you know, like what are the important things to measure? Like which events do, should we be tagging so that we can analyze it? Heap is different in the sense that you just install their, app, their SDK and that's it. Like they will track every event. And then if you want to look at something later, you, you're basically uh, firing up your app in a special debug mode in a sense and then tapping through and doing things and it's that tapping through the app in itself that creates an event. Those events then back into their data so that you can look at, okay, you know, how many, like click this button. Like if you weren't, if you weren't tracking, click the green button, then you can fire up the app in this deep, in your app in the debug mode, click the green button, go onto heap and says that's the click to be green button event. And then you can back into the data you already have so that you can look at the data. Um, so again, like the business intelligence people love this stuff because it means they're not engineering bound by looking at the event. <clears throat> and the third one, which I love is, and a lot of people aren't aware of, of what I call is AppSy, which is what they call um, visual analytics. So what these guys do essentially is you install their SDK, and what you get are heat maps and actual user videos of people interacting with your app, which can be really, really, really insightful. Like, um, you know, it allows you to see things like, here's the screen with the most unresponsive uh, touch events, and, you know, here's the screen where, <coughs> excuse me, Here's the screen where you know people think that something should be happening with this button, but nothing's happening. And so I've seen in the worst egregious case where people just forgot to wire up the Facebook login button. 
So people were tapping, obviously, and they weren't doing it. Right. And they only noticed that because they could see the heat maps and where the unresponsive things were. Um, and yeah, a little PS, really, app banning is only the, the, the reasonable choice these days, in my view, for app store stuff. <clears throat> so here's a, a quick view just of, of AppSy, one of these tools, and it, it shows you heat maps, like where they come from, where they're tapping, you know, uh, and, and I can't show you here, but um, they'll show you things like, okay, well, you know, here's an example, here's a user, here's hear them going through, for example, the sign-up flow. Yep. So it gives you really visual feedback to, like, where are people, like, falling off in the sign-up funnel, in the sign-up funnel, in the checkout funnel, wherever it is that you care about. That's here. All right. So you now got everything under control. Well, mostly you don't have any, you're not getting any crashes. Your APIs are doing okay, and you're measuring your um, you're measuring your um, you know the metrics that matter about those funnels. It start typing. It start um, time to start optimizing and improving those. <clears throat> and really, the way to do this is to be lazy about it. So the funnels that you want to look at first are the high volume ones and the high value. So the high volume funnels. Do I want to put this on here? Yeah, so high volume funnels are things where a lot of people come through. So the, 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 the premium example that a lot of apps have for a high volume funnel is sign up. So one of the first things you should be doing, if you have some sort of a sign up process in your app, you should be looking at that funnel and starting to optimize it to make it better. Because so everyone comes through this funnel, so a small improvement will have a big impact. <clears throat> Similarly, <clears throat> You should start thinking about optimizing what I would call high value funds. So these are things where they may not be the same volume of users going through them, but they're where the, the user has a really strong buy intent. So for example, for an e-commerce app, this would be checkout. You know, this would be like from buy, clicking the buy button through to actually giving you money. Those things are high value, and so you should be optimizing them. Um, basically, what you want to be able to do is um, do A-B tests of those tests and do a visual design and experimentation on those um, uh, on those optimizations without having to, you know, rev the whole app and change, make this change to every user. Um, just because uh, you don't want to do, like, particularly for iOS, this is a problem because, it, you know, you have the review process that can take two weeks. Like, you don't want to do, like, oh, I think we've found out a way to improve the sign-up process, make that whole change, push it out to everybody. Two weeks later, you're like, oh, crap, it's worse. What you want to be able to do is say, okay, let's take 10% of our users, let's give them this new signed-in uh, sign-up funnel, push that out to those 10%, look at the improvement, and then if it's better, then push it out to everybody. And ideally do that without... <clears throat> without having to go through like revving the app in Google Play or, or submitting it for uh, approval in the App Store. Um, so there are a couple of vendors like that. Um, and some of the stuff, I like Lean Plum, Lean Plum a lot for, for reasons that will become clear in the next section. Um, and but there are also things like Optimizely um, and Optimize that have tools that now allow you to do that without actually requiring revving of the app or even um, a lot of engineering help. So just to, to make that um concrete. So the idea is you put an SDK, SDK in there that, that allows you to either on a debug mode on the app or through a, a, GUI, uh, a GUI change these things on the fly, right? Yes. So it's, it's almost spooky <laughs> the first time you see it. So you install the app and you go to whomever's website. And then when you're running the app in the special debug mode, it, which isn't very hard, but you know, once you have that up there, you actually see a visual representation or, or a copy excuse me, of your UI in their website. So at that point, you can go on your on your computer and like change the colors and change the messaging and change the flow, and it will immediately be uh, reflected in the actual app itself. For, for the end users, yep. yeah. <clears throat> but once you've designed it, you push it to a certain amount. Yep. Um, okay, any questions beyond that, you think, on this point? So I just race through my last part. How are we doing? Yeah, here? I think we're, we're doing well. Good. Well, so. So, um, you know, if you're doing this, then once you get to this stage, you're in good shape. Um, and so the stuff that I'm going to talk about next is more sort of the super, what I call the super advanced topics. And really, if, if you pull through and, and do everything I've said so far, plus these other two, then you're in the top, I'm going to say, 0.5% of apps in the App Store. Um, but for some, some apps and some companies, these two things really, really help. <clears throat> So as you know from the invite, about 65% of users disengage from an app, but even worse than that, like you're looking at um, how people 
stop using the app or don't use the app at all, you see that 23% of users, like they open the app once and then never come back. Um, and these are people who, like to keep, to keep that in mind, these aren't just fly-by-night website visitors. These are people who went to the App Store, went to Google Play, looked at the description, decided, you know what, this looks pretty good, I'm going to take the time to install it, open it up once and then never come back. <clears throat> so what do you do in order to try to um, get those people engaged or get more people to remain in your app so or to come back on your app and maybe they've forgotten to use it. Um, and so obviously like the, the number one step is just to make your app more awesome. Um, but also you should consider doing what I would call like an automatic re-engagement campaign. Um, and the reason for that is like having a re-engagement campaign means you know you can and you can automatically reach out to people with messages based on certain events that people that happen in your app. That has shown to reduce churn pretty dramatically, and things like reducing churn is super, super important for profits and for revenue. So a 5% reduction in churn can result in 30 to 50% increase in profits. <clears throat> so fundamentally, re-engagement stuff is basically automatic rules that look at in-app events and then a lack of an action by a user. And so for the dating app example, for example, you know, um, a user might get a push notification uh, just as part of the normal flow of the app saying, hey, you have a new message from Anar, you know. And then if those people get that push notification but don't do anything, then you can have an automatic rule that says, okay, someone got a push notification with saying, you know, they have a new message on the app and 20, within 24 hours they haven't opened it, then you can send another push notification which says, you know, hey, you have an unread message, aren't you curious? So that's a, as an example of, you know, how do you, maybe you reach the first push notification, reach them at a bad time, they're driving or, you know, talking to their wife. Um, but having that second tool then means that you're driving back people who may, may not ever come back to the app ever again. Same thing is like the classic case for re-engagement is cart abandonment. And certainly if you're doing e-commerce, you should be doing this. It's like user adds something to their cart, so clearly has intent to buy, but then never gets through the, the checkout process. You should have an automatic rule that says, okay, within like 12 hours or, or, or a day, you should send a push notification that says, you know what, you have one item in your car, check it out now and you'll get it, you know, on Tuesday. Something like that. As an emergency, try to drive people back in by using automated rules that tie into your analytics. Um, obviously, you know, you should, you should be testing these things. Um, you shouldn't just design one and then, you know, just like with op trying to optimize funnels, you shouldn't just make a rule and then uh, you know send it out to all your users. You definitely should be A/B testing things like what are the best messages, you know what kind of triggers should we be sending, what kind of timing, um, you know what's too pushy, uh, what sort of wording is best, and you should be doing that kind of thing using A/B tests. And the rec again, the reason I like Lean Time for A/B testing is because they also have what they call this automated marketing piece, which ties into their A/B testing tool. Um, so I like I like their approach a lot, and you know I think I think you will too if you look at that. Okay, final piece. Um, so this is more like uh, super advanced onboarding. So this is like okay, you already know what kind of thing gets users to remain in the app, and a lot of the time you already know what kind of users will be stalling your app, or even who they are. So why don't you take some steps so that <clears throat> you increase the likelihood that those users that you already know a fair amount about are likely to take the steps to get them engaged. This can be sh sh shockingly effective. So what I mean is like, why don't you personalize the invite? So if you have a database of users and you have a new app, if they're already client of yours, you know they already have an account with you. You already know where, you know, their name, you know where they live, you know how much money they spend, right? whatever, right? Why don't you pre-create an account for them in the app, including filling out their name, their profile picture, if you have that, and then when you do the invite, make the invite personalized so that when they click the install link in their email, they download the app. When they first open up the app, their pictures there, like their account, everything is ready to go, and they just start using the app. Like, why make them go through the whole, like, Oh, log in with your account. So you don't have an account, let's create a mobile specific account. Okay, now upload a picture, which you've already done in our service. Like, don't do that. Like, make a personalized invite, which makes it much more likely they'll get engaged, that they'll start doing the kind of things that you want them to do for whatever the purpose of your app is. Uh, the one warning is it can be a little spooky. 
to just download an app you know, that you have no idea that they personalize, open up, and the first thing you see is your own picture. Like, that can be. And is this something that's just typically custom done, or are there tools that you've seen make this bit easier? <clears throat> so you have to write a fair amount of code to do the integration with your backend systems. But the tool that, like, I think maybe I've got it on the next slide here. I'll talk about it on the next slide. Yeah. Um, and also, like another example is just localization. Like if you if you're rolling out to specific locations, you know where they are. If you're running an ad in a specific city, have the installing for whatever there be city specific, so they open up. They don't have to choose their location from a giant you know word map, world map, or something. So the way you would do that is um, on the sort of what I call attribution side. This is technology that's originally uh, devised to do um, ad attribution. So this is like okay. If you're running huge ad campaigns that drive installs to your um, to your app, you may be running different kind of variants in different places. So you want to know, okay, which which ad causes the most installs and which you know ad causes the most engaged users. That kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> basically, what they do is they do device fingerprinting. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that tech, but if you, you email me, I'll describe what they do. Um, and so. Because they've recently added, a couple of these firms recently added what I call real-time attribution, which means that right when the first time a user runs an app, you can query their service and they'll tell you in real time which link they came in on. Because of that, you can then have the app run the first time and you know exactly which link, invite, invite, invite link uh, they came in on. That can then, then you have to write a fair amount of code after that. Like you have to say, okay, tie that invite link into your existing system so that you can fetch down their, their account info and their profile stuff. But that's the key missing part that was missing up until now. Um, and the recommended vendor for this that I like a lot is Tapstream. They work across iPhone, Android, everything. Um, and you probably get a discount if you tell them I sent you. <laughs> I hope. Um, I, that's kind of hand wavy. And if you want a little bit more detail on that, feel free to email me um, about that. Um, and like I said, really, like if you're if you're in a position where your app is stable, your your API endpoints are doing well, you're measuring things, like you're starting to optimize the, the funnels that you know are, are kind of underperforming. Once you've done all that, and if you start doing custom onboarding and like have an active reengagement campaign, you, your app is among the most advanced. Like you really are. Like it's it's rare to see this kind of stuff even in the the very high performance apps out there. Okay. So then I'm going to do my pitch. Basically, um, you don't have to do all this alone. Like, particularly if you had an app developed by an agency, that may not be hard to get them on board to do all this stuff. Um, you should just sign up for App Aftercare. Um, basically, it means things like, you know, crashes disappear, ratings improve, you know, everything just gets better, including your love life, um, without, you, <laughs> without you worrying. Um, and because I do things like partner with the with the companies that I like, like criticism, um, you get you get a bunch of services already included as part of the price. Um, and right now I'm looking for three three or so um, awesome clients to to go forward within 2015. Uh, to uh, three or four. Um, if you're interested in that, so yeah, just hit me up. On, and on the like I said at the start, is, I mean we've we've worked with INR for you know, quite a lot of things, and and um, the reason we do that is because he's got really deep knowledge of how this stuff works and, and how to do it properly. So, um, you know, obviously we, we you know, put uh, put our faith in him as well. So I don't just have a great, you know, taste in cat pictures. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, I think that's me, yes. Perfect. Um, so we've, we've got a couple, couple questions I'm going to tackle here, but uh, like I said, if you have, uh, if there are any other questions you wanted to throw out there, folks, now now's your uh, your last moment. We'll be wrapping this up shortly. Um, so just to kind of cap off a couple things here. Um, first of all, uh, you know, thank you very much, Einar. Of course, You're welcome. Uh, you know, it's great to have you here. Um, this this is being recorded. I think I mentioned this, so we'll we'll send it out um, in in a, a few days. And uh, it, there's also an ebook that Einar helped put together. That um, if you you know you want it more in a, a written form. That's available as well on our website. And um, what I what I'd also suggest to you, for, at least for the performance related things, criticism does a lot of benchmarking information. So if you're curious, like where your app should be and whatnot, take a look at data.criticism.com. There's a bunch of you know publicly available benchmarks that that, that might be useful. So um, with that, let me you know tackle a couple couple quick questions here. Um, so let me let me. Up one of these here. So, in terms of you know 
A-B testing funnels, you know, how, how often is that? How frequent, you know, how, what's your approach there? So <clears throat> really the frequency depends on how, what volume of users you have. Like if you have a really low number of users, it's hard to get tests with definite results um, if you run them more than, like, you know, if you run them too often. Uh, so it's, it's kind of driven by that, but a good rule of thumb is like, you know, do one test every month or so if you have enough traffic to do that. Um, that's usually what I do for my clients. I pick something that you care about, ideally the highest, where you think is the highest value, and then run the test that month and you look at the data as it comes in and push it out. Okay. So I'm going to paraphrase this question and, and um, for the person that asked it, if, if it's not quite on point, try, try and ask it again. I'm going to ho hopefully get, get it right here. But um, I, I think the question, so I'm going to read it to you exactly what it is and then I'll we'll try okay. to decipher it. So what inference can be made about velocity from one, two, three, four star rankings in an app store? Um, so I, I'm assuming the question's about release frequency and you know how they kind of fix issues and whatnot. Um, uh, I'm not sure there is a correlation between that. Like, like it's not. I mean, this is probably answering the wrong question. But in terms of like rank, like downloads, like if, if that's what you mean by velocity, like I, I once was running some experiments and I had the number one, I think, car payment calculator in the U in the world, maybe for a while. Um, and I did something really like stupendously stupid, <laughs> which caused like 80% of my apps to users to have a crash. It was fun. Um, and it went from having like, you know, 4.8 or so average to having two something. Um, and so it was almost overnight because all of a sudden people were like, dude, this was working. Why did you break it? <laughs> and so um, I was looking at downloads there and it really like that kind of correlation, like it took my, my downloads per day, I think I was getting 500 or so, four or 500 a day, um, it took it down to under 100, like within a week. Wow. Um, so if that's what you mean by velocity, then, then certainly like having a severe crash impact will rapidly mess with your rankings and messing with your rankings will you know, obliterate, particularly for an app like that, will obliterate your downloads. So I got a clarification here, so thanks Bill. Um, I think that what he's asking is, you know, um, you know, if you have a one, two, one or two star app, like, you know, how screwed are you? How how can you, you know, how can you? How quickly can you fix it? it? Yeah. Well, um, pretty quickly. Like, honestly, like their, their, their key metric is like, we will show the average rank ranking for the latest version if we have enough ratings. And that number to me seems to be pretty low, like 10, 10 or so good ratings will, will do it again for you. So maybe fixing the bugs plus your your suggestion of reaching out to the people that are affected if you can. That's what I mean. Like, like so if you have an app that has one or two stars, but you know you haven't got like something like a ten table with some sort of a query, like please rate my app if you like it. If you do like fix the fix the crash and then install something like Attentive, it's quite sim it's quite quick to get you know ten reviews if you have a reasonable number of downloads, even a reasonably low number of downloads. Like if you're looking at fifty or so a day, yeah, it wouldn't take you very long. It takes about a week to get. 10 or so good ones. And I'll, you know, mention, at least on the, on the criticism side, we have a way that uh, you can you can kind of tag your users in a, an obfuscated way. So, you know, once you've installed it, you can um, find out who were impacted by crashes and, and reach out in the future going forward once you've kind of moved to that point. Um, okay, folks, um, you know, it, looking at the, the clock here, I want to be uh, respectful of, of time. If you, you know, have other questions, Einar uh, graciously put his, his email on the, the earlier slide, but maybe you could mention it again verbally. Sure, it's anr at appaftercare.com. Perfect. So, um, Anar, thank you so much for sure. taking the time. You know, I think uh, got a lot of comments that were coming through just to say this was insightful, so thanks Great. thanks again. Uh, like like we mentioned, uh, there's the recording coming out and an ebook that covers the similar material is also available on Criticism's website, so you can you know, choose the format you want to consume the info, uh, and certainly uh, you know take a look. Obviously, uh, criticism if you're looking for some of the the, the maintenance and uh, app performance stuff, and and uh, do look up app aftercare and INR for uh, some some you know insight regarding how to actually maintain your app long run. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out of your day and joining us, and uh, we're going to sign off. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.